Today we're going to be looking at Russia for the fourth time so far. I've covered three other videos on Russia before, first one being the authorigin eh, the authorigins, that's a new word, the origins of authoritarianism in Russia by Kraut, uh, the day democracy died by NFKRZ, and a third one which no one watched called um, Shopping in the Soviet Union, which was by the channel Cold War. Today we're going to be looking at Epic History TV's History of Russia. It's a 47 minute long video, so this reaction is probably gonna be two parts. It might even be three parts. We'll see how how much I have to say and what we what we get into. This was suggested by four users on the channel because I searched the YouTube comments for Epic History TV, so thank you for suggesting us. We have Eric Dollar, Flying Eagle, Two and Two, and Kanon Two, it's in Russian, so I, I can't pronounce it, but shout out to you guys. Thank you very much for the suggestion. I've seen Epic History TV's video on Napoleon 1809 to 1814. It's three and a half hours long. It's incredible. Go watch it. I won't do a reaction for it because it would have to be a 15 part series. Without further ado, let's get into the history of Russia, Rurik, I don't know if I pronounced that right, to revolution. Cheers. Water, but cheers. For thousands of years, the lands known today as Russia and Ukraine were inhabited by nomadic tribes and mysterious Bronze Age cultures. The only record they left were their graves. In the great open grasslands of the south, the steppe, they buried their chieftains beneath huge mounds called kurgans. Hmm. The ancient that. Greek oh. historian Herodotus called these people Scythians. Their lands were overrun by the same nomadic warriors who brought down the Roman Empire. Uh, the land was then settled okay. by Slavs. They shared some language and culture, but were divided into many different tribes. Vikings from Scandinavia, known in the east as Varangians, rode up Russia's long rivers on daring raids and trading expeditions. According to hmm. legend, the East Slavs asked a Varangian chief named Rurik to be their prince and unite the tribes. He accepted and made his capital at Novgorod. His dynasty, the Rurikids, would rule Russia for 700 years. Wow, okay. His people called themselves the Rus and gave their name to the land. Rurik's success. So that's funny. So in German, so in English, as obviously we call it Russia, but in German it's Russland, right? Which is Land of Rus, if you will. So that's fascinating that German, probably being an older language than English, if you will, that might not be true, but um, actually has more of those connections. And now 700 years, that's really quite a long time for a monarchy to be running. And wow, okay. Also another thing, this is not my 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 expertise in history, so this is probably going to be all new for me, so let's just keep going. Cesar Oleg captured Don't Kiev. Don't expect much interruption. Making is it the what capital I'm of a new state, Kievan Rus. Yep. A century later, seeking closer ties with the Byzantine Empire to the south, Vladimir the Great adopted their religion and converted to Orthodox Christianity. He is still venerated today as the man who brought Christianity to Ukraine and Russia. Fascinating. Hmm. Yaroslav the Wise codified... So sorry, just a question though. So was, was Christianity sort of banned at this time? Was this considered... I wish I knew more about this, but please let me, let me know in the comments, guys, if you guys could fill in some history here for me. ...laws and conquered new lands. His reign marked the golden age of Kievan Rus. It was amongst the most sophisticated and powerful states in Europe. But after Yaroslav's death, his sons fought amongst themselves. Kievan Rus disintegrated into a patchwork of feuding princedoms. Mm. Just as a deadly new threat emerged from the east. The Mongols under Genghis Khan had overrun much of Asia. Now they launched a great raid across the Caucasus Mountains and defeated the Kievan princes at the Battle of the Kalka River, but then withdrew. Fourteen years later, the Mongols returned. 
a gigantic army led by Batu Khan overran the land. Cities that resisted were burnt, their people slaughtered. Hmm. The city of Novgorod... I thought that Mongols were supposed to be tolerant, right? Isn't that what that one video said? <laughs> ...was spared because it submitted to the Mongols. Its prince, Alexander Nevsky, then saved the city again, defeating the Teutonic Knights at the Battle of the Ice, fought above a frozen lake. He remained... Who are the Teutonic Knights? Sorry. Again, not my, this is not my forte. I'm more in the 20th and 19th century, but who are the Tectonic Knights then? Please, guys, you gotta let me know in the comments here. This is, yeah, this might actually be a three-part video. It's one of Russia's most revered heroes. The Mongols ruled the land as conquerors. Their new empire was called the Golden Horde, ruled by a Khan from his new capital at Sarai. The Rus princes were his vassals. They were forced to pay tribute or suffer devastating reprisal raids. Mm. They called their oppressors Tatars. They lived under the Tatar yoke. Oh. Alexander Nevsky's okay. son, Daniel, founded the Grand Principality of Moscow, which quickly grew in power. Under the great Uzbek Khan, the Tatars converted to Islam. So that's why to this day the Tatars are still... Okay, okay, there's the connection. Facing power, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania defeated the Tatars at the Battle of Blue Waters and conquered Kiev. Eighteen okay. years later, Dmitry Donskoy, Grand Prince of Moscow, also defeated the Tatars at the Great Battle of Kulikova Field. After years of infighting, the Golden Horde now began to disintegrate into rival Khanates. Constantinople, Which also each other. capital and last outpost of the once great Byzantine Empire, fell to the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Some hailed Moscow as the Third Rome, the seat of Orthodox Christian faith. Now Rome and Constantinople had fallen. Meanwhile, the Grand Princes of Moscow continued to expand their power, annexing Novgorod and forging the first Russian state. Hmm. At the Ugra River, Ivan the... So 1478 is when Russia is formed, kind of? Eh, okay, we'll see. ...third of Moscow faced down the Tatar army and forced it to retreat. Russia had finally cast off the Tatar yoke. Hmm. Under Grand Prince Vasily III, Moscow continued to grow in size and power. His son, Ivan IV, was crowned the first Tsar of Russia. He would be remembered as Ivan the Terrible. Yes. Ivan conquered Tatar lands in Kazan and Astrakhan, but was defeated in the Livonian War by Sweden and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Ivan's modern I think that it's kind of forgotten and I forget this sometimes too and again this is not really my expertise realm of history but I forgot sometimes people forget how powerful the kingdom of Sweden really was it was one of the dominant powers in Europe and I mean throughout the even up to the Napoleonic Wars that they had the ability to really tilt the scale in a country's favor if they decided to join on a certain side and they were really really powerful and now we sort of look at sweden as the place of i don't know eurovision and abba but back in the day it really was a feared kingdom i suppose rising reforms gave way to a reign of terror and mass executions fueled by his violent paranoia yes Rush. And this is where, in the Kraut video as well, this was talking about how the peasants were the one that always suffered the most because of all the tribute was paid, right, to the Tsar instead of, you know, well, it's already discussed in that video. Go check it out if you want, if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, ...was still vulnerable. Raiders from the Crimean Khanate were able to burn Moscow itself. But the next year, Russian forces routed the Tatars at Molody, just south of the city. So that's the first time Moscow's going to be Cossacks okay. now lived on the open steppe, 
a lawless region between three warring states. They were skilled horsemen who lived freely and were often recruited by Russia and Poland to fight as mercenaries. Ivan the Terrible's own son, the Tsarevich, fell victim to one of his father's violent rages, bludgeoned to death with the royal scepter. Oof. Oof. Okay. The Cossack adventurer Yermak Timofeyevich led the Russian conquest of Siberia, defeating Tatars and subjugating indigenous tribes. In the north, Arkhangelsk was founded, for the time being Russia's only seaport linking it to Western Europe, though it was icebound in winter. Yep. Ivan the Terrible was... So two questions. One... Why did Russia ever invade Siberia? I mean, was this just for, for glory, for, conquer, for, for conquering? Was this a resource-based reason? I, I don't understand why you would conquer this land, which, as was said, is mostly inhabited by indigenous peoples, right? And I'm not saying this in some, like, oh, you have to be... That's not what I mean. I'm just curious as to the reason why that you would, in, you would invade um, this land. The other thing, too, is that... Um, <laughs> I guess it's a running theme in Russian history to want a warm water port because Russia, I suppose, has never had one. Correct me if I'm wrong. That, that connects to the, uh, that connects to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Succeeded by his son, oh, the Mediterranean. I, who died childless. It was the end of the Rurikid dynasty. Ivan's advisor, Boris Godunov, became Tsar. But after his sudden death, his widow and teenage son were brutally murdered, and the throne seized by an imposter claiming to be Ivan the Terrible's son. Well, at least they weren't he thrown out of a window. Was soon murdered. Russia okay. slid into anarchy, the so-called Time of Troubles. Rebels and foreign armies laid waste to the land, and the population was decimated by famine and plague. Polish troops occupied Moscow. Swedish troops seized Novgorod. The Russian state seemed on the verge of extinction. Okay, so that's the second time Moscow is burned. We'll count here. Okay, so that was part one. So quickly, all right. So already Moscow's burned twice. They've... God, uh, imagine how much blood has been shed. So if I'm correct in saying that they were founded in 14, was that 1468, maybe 1478? Within less than 100 years, it seems that Russia is on the brink of extinction. Interesting. Okay, let's keep going. In 1612, Russia was in a state of anarchy. They called it the Time of Troubles. The people were terrorized by war, famine, and plague. Up to a third of them perished. Foreign troops occupied Moscow, Smolensk, and Novgorod. But then, Russia fought back. Prince Pozharsky and a merchant, Kuzma Minin, led the Russian militia to Moscow and threw out the Polish garrison. Hmm. Since 2005, this event has been commemorated every 4th of November as Russian Yikes. National Unity Day. Ah, I see. Ah, okay, okay. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Interesting. I always wondered what that statue was. Didn't look like a very the big Russian event Assembly, for National Unity Day. The Zemsky Sabor realized the country had to unite behind a new ruler and elected a 16-year-old noble, Mikhail Romanov, as the next Tsar. Ah, the Romanov dynasty. His dynasty ah. would rule Russia for the next 300 years. I see. Tsar Mikhail exchanged territory for peace, winning Russia much-needed breathing space. His son, Tsar Alexei, implemented a new legal code, the Sabornoya Ulugenya, it turned all Russian peasants, 80% of the population, that portrait into is serfs, effectively slaves, their status inherited by their children and with no freedom to travel or choose their master. 
Yeah, and so this was brought up in the origins of Russian authoritarianism well, is that this was really sort of the, right, obviously it didn't exactly start here, right, just as it didn't exactly start under Ivan the Terrible, but this was where you sort of see the roots of what we're seeing to this day. It was a system that dominated Russian rural life for the next 200 years. Yep. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Nikon, imposed religious reforms that split the church between reformers and old believers. Hmm. It's a schism that continues to this day. Interesting. Ukrainian Cossacks, rebelling against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, recognized Tsar Alexei as overlord in exchange for his military support. It led to the Thirteen Years' War between Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Russia emerged victorious, reclaiming Smolensk and taking control of eastern Ukraine. I see, I see. A revolt against... Okay, yeah, because this would not be the first time that Poland would go to war with Russia, right? I think, well, probably not the most famous, but the one that has one of the most impacts, what is not talked about is, I believe it was in 1920, it might be 1921, correct me if I'm wrong on that date there, but between the uh, between the Poles and the Russians um, during this period of time. It's an often forgotten about war, though it was incredibly important in forging Polish independence, which after the collapse of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, many decades before, was something that was, um, that, that had not existed, right? And even Woodrow Wilson, in his 13 points, one of his points was independence for the Polish people, though, infamously, he did not exactly define how that would look like. Against Tsarist government, led by a renegade Cossack, Stenka Razin, brought anarchy to southern Russia. It was finally suppressed. Razin was brought to Moscow and executed by quartering. The simply but highly educated Fyodor I'm sure III that's passed many reforms. He abolished Mesnichestva, the system that had awarded government posts according to nobility rather than ah, merit, and symbolically burned the ancient books of rank. Hmm. But Fyodor died aged just 19. His sister Sophia became princess regent, ruling on behalf of her younger brothers, the joint Tsars, Ivan V and Peter I. After centuries of conflict, Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth signed a Treaty of Eternal Peace. Russia then joined the Holy League in its war against the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, we've, we've secured our western border. Let's go invade the south. <laughs> Sophia's reign also um, saw the first treaty between Russia and China, establishing the frontier between the two states. Whoa, okay, so this wasn't really covered. So this is all owned by Russia by 1689, unless this graphic, okay, wow, so 1689 had conquered this far. The question that I have is that, one, how, two, why, three, how long? Right? How did they conquer? The, it seems like their most further settlement. I mean, look at Moscow here, right? And this is just on a computer screen. You can only imagine how many kilometers it is from here to there, right? Multiple, multiple days on a train, right? Let alone doing this by foot in these, in, you know, in summer, obviously the conditions are different, but I really want to know that. Maybe there's a video, maybe that'll be the next video. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. 19 minutes, yeah, this is going to be a three-parter. Unless I sit here and not say anything for the next 15 minutes. That's not going to happen. At age 17, Peter I seized power from his half-sister, Sophia. Peter became the first Russian ruler to travel abroad. Hmm. He toured Europe with his grand embassy seeking allies for Russia's war against Turkey, and cool. learning the latest developments in science and shipbuilding. Fascinating. The war against Turkey was successfully concluded by the Treaty of Constantinople. Russia gained Azov from Turkey's ally, the Crimean Khanate, 
and with it, a foothold on the Black Sea. Yes. Peter made many reforms, seeking to turn Russia into a modern European state. He demanded Russian nobles dress and behave like Europeans. Hmm. He made those who refused to shave pay a beard tax. <laughs> okay. Peter built the first Russian navy, reformed the army and government, and promoted industry, trade, and education. Fascinating. In the Great Northern War, Russia, Poland, Lithuania, and Denmark took on the dominant power in the Baltic, Sweden. Yep. The war began badly for Russia with a disastrous defeat to Charles XII of Sweden at Narva. But Russia won a second Battle of Narva. Okay. Before crushing Charles XII's army at the Battle of Poltava. On the Baltic. How did the ch sorry? <sighs> I wish I knew more. It's frustrating, but it's also fascinating because how the hell did they get the how the hell did they get down here, from from Sweden? You know what I mean? Unless are they also fighting? Unless the Connets are also in this war? Baltic coast. Let's keep going. Peter completed construction of a new capital, Saint Petersburg. Petersburg. Yep. The building of what would become Russia's second largest city among coastal marshes was a remarkable achievement, though it cost the lives of many thousands of serfs. The Great Northern War ended with the Treaty of Neustadt. Russia's gains at Sweden's expense made it the new dominant Baltic power. Four years before his death, Peter was declared Peter the Great, father of his country, emperor of all the Russias. Hmm. Fascinating. So I wonder then, so how is Peter the Great remembered modernly in that sense? Is he, again, modern Russia is obviously, yeah, a little tied up in some political things right now. But I'm kind of curious of what is sort of taught about Peter the Great. Is he still seen as a reformer as opposed to someone like Ivan the Terrible, right? And sort of how... He's seen in his sort of reign of terror that happened throughout Russia, though there were also some reforms in there as well. Um, I have a sense that Russian history is bloody and complex, right? <laughs> if, if I've learned anything in the last 14 minutes and 50 seconds, it's that it's, it's bloody and complicated, but it, this is really, really interesting. Maybe we can do another part and then we'll call that a part one. I wanted to make maybe half an hour and then half an hour, but... We'll see. Peter was succeeded by his wife, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Then his grandson, Peter II, who died of smallpox, aged just 14. Empress Anna Yanavna, daughter of Peter the Great's half-brother, Ivan V, was famed for her decadence and the influence of her German lover, Ernst Biron. Hmm. During Anna's reign, Vitus Bering, a Danish explorer in Russian service, led the first expedition to chart the coast of Alaska. He also discovered the Aleutian Islands, and later gave his name to the sea that separates Russia and America. Ah, okay. Cool. Didn't know that. After Anna's death, her infant grandnephew Ivan VI was deposed by Peter the Great's daughter, Elizabeth. Ivan VI spent his entire life in captivity. Until age 23, he was murdered by his guards during a failed rescue attempt. Elizabeth, meanwhile, yeah. was famed for her vanity, extravagance, and many young lovers. But mm. she was also capable of decisive leadership in alliance with France and Austria, Elizabeth led Russia into the Seven Years' War yeah. against Frederick the Great of Prussia. The Russian army inflicted a crushing defeat on Frederick at the Battle of Kunersdorf, but failed to exploit its victory. Meanwhile, in St. Petersburg, the Winter Palace was completed at vast expense. 
One of these years, I'd really like to see that. It would remain the monarch's official residence. Though I might be waiting a while. Right up until the Russian Revolution yep. of 1917. Peter III was Peter the Great's grandson by his elder daughter Anna Petrovna, who died as a consequence of childbirth. Raised in Denmark, Peter spoke hardly any Russian and hmm. greatly admired Russia's enemy, Frederick the Great. So he had Russia swap sides in the Seven Years' War, saving Frederick from almost certain defeat. Fascinating. Peter's actions angered many army officers. Of course. And he'd always been despised by his German wife, Catherine. Together, they deposed Peter III, who died a week later in suspicious <laughs> circumstances. His own wife deposed him? Oh, man. His wife, Catherine, became Empress of Russia. Wait, yeah, okay. Her yeah. reign would be remembered as one of Russia's most glorious. Huh. Catherine II is one of the most glorious. Okay. In the early 1700s, Peter Let's the Great's going. reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become yeah. Empress of Russia, who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. Okay. I think that's... No, you know, let's go a little more, a little more, a little more. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment. Actually, no, you know what? I changed my mind. All right, that's going to be part one for now. Yeah, 2640. Yeah, okay, this is going to be a three-parter. It's going to be a three-parter, boys. I hope that's okay. So far, this is super, super interesting. I really, really like this. Um, yeah, sorry that I haven't been able to add too much, but I hope you've enjoyed watching this with me and seeing my reactions to everything. And please help me out with some of those questions that I had in the comments because I really, really, really want to know. And yeah, this whole part of history is not really my forte. So, hey, once we get to the 1800s and the 1900s, or sorry, the, the 1900s and the 2000s, or the, yeah, then I'll be able to... You know, fill in a little more. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you all very much for joining me. And uh, yeah, let's keep going. Either be two parts or three parts, probably three parts with how much I'm pausing and how interesting this video is. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for the suggestion. Great video. I'll see you guys in part two in a couple days. Take care.